Oh, wonderful. And we, we are very excited to be here tonight because um, we feel like we have some important information to, to share with you. And so, um, Ashley, Delon and I are going to try to be real short about our part because I think you really um, came here to hear the voices of our families. And I want them to have the maximum amount of time to share. Um, but I think that some of the history and the context, like Daniel was talking about, will help you to kind of understand how we started this particular model, which is called Family Center Treatment. And you all got folders in front of you with all kinds of articles and things that have been written on the program and, and about what we do. Uh, but I think it's important to, to know how we got there. Um, because, you know, not just in the foster care field, but also in, in the treatment field, folks had a very hard line about women and, and their children when they were substance abuse. And so even in the substance abuse field, where I've worked, I feel like I need to stand up to you guys, um, where I worked for over 30 years, there was um, a real disconnect, really. Even though people talk about addiction being a family disease, they really didn't address the issue of family and treatment. And in fact, um, just a little sideline, when I first started this model, I would go talk about it at conferences, people actually even came to physical blows over the discussion of having children in treatment um, because they felt that that was not a place for children, that you know folks should pull themselves up by the bootstrap, so to speak, and take care of their addiction and go on. And so obviously I didn't feel that way and talk about how we got there, but, but all of this falls into the context of what Daniel was kind of talking about is happening now as folks are looking at the, the child welfare system. At the time that I started SHIELDS, there were over 1,200 infants that were being born every year at just one hospital, King Drew Medical Center, um, babies born exposed to substances. It was the middle of the <coughs> crack epidemic. And what was happening is that all of those infants were being removed from their parents. There, there were no real resources for them. And you know, when, when we're looking at an issue like this, you really just can't talk about that particular family and what happened to them. Um, all of you are kind of young and um, a few years older. So <laughs> when you see situations like this, and I think that's what Daniel is, is hopefully trying to get across to you here, is that you have to think of the larger picture and what really happens. But if you can imagine 1,200 infants in one community being taken from their mothers, what, what do you think that does to the community itself? <coughs> And that's what was happening in Watts. We were not just destroying individual families, but we were destroying an entire community. A community where the culture in that community was all about family. And so the things that have happened and all the things that you have seen in the news or you saw in the news directly around that time about all the, the gangs, the drugs, the violence, all those things that were happening, in my opinion, you know, all of this was interrelated with it. You know, because when you remove, you know, families, when you destroy families and you take them apart, and unfortunately, when you have <coughs> no resources to offer them, what happens is those families remain apart. And so there is no opportunity for the family to heal or the community to heal either. You know, and so the long-term impact uh, of that particular move, and what scares me is, is I'm beginning to see an interest in doing that again <coughs> and removing again is that you have to think again about what it does to an entire community and impact on, on, on that um, in terms of, of you know, why, why are all of our children in jail you know, in our community? You know, why do they grow up to, to end up in jail? Why do we have a community where folks don't have their high school diplomas? Now things have turned around dramatically in our community and, and if we have time we can do some talking about that. But I also think that one of the reasons why they've turned around is because we've altered how we started working with families, that we put the emphasis on keeping them together so that families were not destroyed. And in that regards, the community was able to <coughs> begin to heal. And because if you look, I mean, I'm always proud of this because we used to be number one in everything. Well, number one in everything that was bad. You know, we were the number one, you know, gang involved community. We were the number one children removed from the home, you know, community. We were, we were number one in everything. Everything that was negative, Compton Watts was number one, okay? Now, 
We're not. We're not even number two, you know, believe it or not. We're, we're down there at number like four or five. And communities that, you know, like Venice, are much higher up on the list now than we are. And, and I think that's directly because, again, in our community, we started doing something <coughs> differently. Not just with individual programs, but we really started working together as a community in order to put our focus on keeping families together and putting together the resources in such a way that they could really utilize them and maximize them. You look like you have a question. I was looking at you. No, no, no. I, no I, I'm just listening. I'm listening. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm curious. You know what? Yeah. You know, you think that the the change in Compton Watts was because of this kind of shift yes, in I the do. way we treat families. Yes, I do. And so, Definitely. and you're talking about these measures, and, I, and I'm wondering. You know, we're very interested in numbers. Right. You know, because that's our culture, and also because. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <coughs> Introduce yourself. I'm Kelly. I can't. I can't. Hi, Kelly. <laughs> but um, the, the what I you know what are the what are some kind of measures of that of, of that improved of the improved neighborhood? Do you see better grades? Do you see better uh, graduation rates? But better everything. everything. Better everything. That's what I said. I mean, if you if you look at the numbers and you know it's interesting um, because I think you were talking about people never like to look at the positives. You know, the, the stories that get in the news for all of you journalism folks in here are usually the negative things, you know, the things that are sensational. And so when you start doing things in a different way, you know, then folks don't necessarily want to report on those. You know, those don't make the paper. But if you look at, for example, the detention rates in, in child welfare, if you look at the Compton office, you will see that they are much lower than other offices. And again, I think there's because there's been a real emphasis on in that office and all the partner agencies that work with it on keeping families together, you know? Because if you look at the numbers, and Daniel, you mentioned this briefly when we started talking, those 15 cases that they were talking about. I mean, the reality- about today's news. Yes, yeah. today's news. The, the <clears throat> reality is, is if you look at child welfare, you look at the cases that come in, because they always talk about the high numbers of referrals that come in all the time. But in reality, the majority of those cases are really general abuse and neglect situations. Situations where resources are not there. You know, I mean, some of the key things we work with are substance abuse, mental health, and domestic violence. Now, these are all situations where I'm not trying to say that they aren't severe or things that need, don't need to be addressed, but they are things that are treatable. They are things that, that can be addressed. And in the majority of cases, the children are not at any kind of serious risk. You know, and if they are at risk, it's usually like a temporary situation when addressed where families can, can get back together or if intervention is done, they can stay together. And so, but it's always those cases, those far extreme cases that are the ones that we hear about, the ones that we talk about. You know, but in reality, the majority of the children that we see, you know, and I'm not making you all uncomfortable, the majority of children we see, they just come from chaotic lifestyles. You know, chaotic lifestyles that, that have been, you know, affected by their parents' substance abuse. And so they may have, you know, not gone to school on a regular basis, they may have changed schools, but in terms of fear of, of life or, or death kinds of issues, those are not the situations that we normally see with our families. You know, and I'm not saying that there are none in, in terms of all, all the families that we've seen over the years, but those are by and far the exceptions and, and not the rule. Okay? So that's the first thing to say. But I, I want to get back to kind of like how we got to, to where we are in family-centered treatment. Because again, in the substance abuse field, this was not a way of, of looking at, at treatment. And um, at the time when the crack epidemic occurred, I actually was working for LA County, um, the Alcohol and Drug Office. And I was char in charge of planning and program <coughs> development. And so I saw what was going on here in our communities. And I said, you know, we need to do things differently. We need to have a program where children could come. So just kind of like a humorous story about how advocacy changes things. I had went to the state of California and I said, I have this model, you know, this model about you know, doing family-centered treatment, doing day, day treatment, where women can bring their children. That way we don't have to take their kids away. You know, well, they can come to treatment every day, they bring their kids with them, we'll have child, you know, children's services on site. And I was literally laughed out 
of their offense. Okay? They said that will never work. You know, no woman is going to come to treatment and bring her kids. That's just not going to happen. And I'm like, I thought differently, but so a couple months later, there were a couple of doctors who uh, started an outcry, really. Uh, Dr. Lynn Yonakura and Dr. Exelina Bean, <coughs> who were out of Harbor and King Hospitals, and went to one of the senators that was in the legislature at the time and said, you know, this is ridiculous. We're removing these babies all the time. One was an obstetrician, the other was a pediatrician. And we don't have anything to do to help these families. You need to do something. So all of a sudden now, there was a demand for a model for services, you know, to address women and children. So all of a sudden now, I get a call from the state, so you can figure out what happened now, about how wonderful now my model is. <laughs> <laughs> and gee, can we try it out? <laughs> and so anyway, that was all right. I got to try out my model. So we, we developed the program. I ended up leaving the county and going to King Hospital to start our first program at Shields called the, the Genesis Family <coughs> and Treatment Program. Now, so, and which is where Anita went through. And so, you know, I guess that the, the interesting part of that it is not only did, did women come with their children, they didn't stop coming with their children. And once we opened this particular door, I mean, we have, at Shields, we now have 10 treatment programs. We've, we've never really advertised <laughs> our programs because people come, you know, because folks do want help. You know, I, I always say this, I have yet to meet someone who told me that they woke up one morning and said, gee, I think I'll become an addict. You know, that, that is not like a life choice that people make. You know, addiction it is, uh, addiction is a situation where folks are addressing the pain in their lives. You know, and they find a way to do it, find a way to numb that pain. You know, and the majority of the women that come to see us, they come from histories of, you know, trauma and abuse, or histories of families who also used addiction uh, as a mean to address the issues and things in their lives. And so, what one of the primary reasons I wanted to do this kind of model is, is to keep the families together, but also to address that issue of intergenerational cycle of abuse that we see in, in this particular problem. Because folks needed to learn a different way of responding to the issues that happen in their lives and instead of what had been modeled you know, before them. You know, and and our, our mothers need to, to learn to parent in a different way than they potentially were parented. You know, that was something else I learned early on. And Charlene is sitting here. Charlene has been working with me for 22 years. You know, <coughs> she's been over our child development services forever. And I think one of the things we learned right from the beginning is that we sometimes we make an assumption that um, folks know how to parent. You know, and and even with that, we we make an assumption. Even if we say we're going to teach them parenting. We make an assumption of their baseline of skills. Well, I, I think it was our, we opened in September, first programming, so Christmas was right around the corner. And so we had a couple things happen. We had gotten all these Barbies from Mattel, you know, and so we were real excited to be able to give them to, to the kids in the program. So we found out very quickly that it was the mothers that wanted the Barbies, you know, because many, most of our mothers, they, they also have never had that opportunity to be kids in their lives, too. And, and so, you know, as we're looking at this issue, I need you to keep that in mind also, because, again, we have to start somewhere and go in somewhere, you know, and begin to do this. I, we, we learned then that folks didn't know nursery rhymes, nursery rhymes or... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Jingle Bells, we started Jingle Bells, I think we got through the first two lines and everybody stopped singing, you know, I mean, it, and it's like, and I'm thinking, man, gosh, everything was Jingle Bells, right? You know, but no, not everybody does. And, and so we needed to start in a place to provide those really comprehensive services so, again, that families could begin to heal, you know, and I, I guess the other little piece of that is, is what well, Delana's going to talk a little bit about our model so that you understand it. But, but again, I, I think that we began to see very quickly that if we were able to provide this opportunity for parents to, to be together with their children, that they did not any longer need the involvement of the Department of Children and Family Services. So one of the things that we have done over the years, and 
just tell you a little bit briefly because it I guess I got incensed at the article today and so I'm kind of responding to that too because you know one of the things that we've been able to do as we partner with the department is go out together and do assessments and and because of that we've been able to get families into treatment before things got out of hand before things got to the point where you know removal or temporary removal was necessary and the, I feel like the department has done a really good job of you know working with us in order to, to do that to make sure that families can stay together and that they don't have to be disrupted because you know I mean I don't I don't know if our children none of you were in foster care though no you were able to go with relatives so but if you spoke to some of our kids that have been in foster care you know the number of times that they moved you know the number of disruptions in their lives you know when the alternative is you could be in an environment with your mother working you hear them talk about the support they're here for support when they can be there and be a part of that support for their mother and, and learn how to be a family again you know that becomes the key key thing in their lives you know to keep them together so but I, I'm going to kind of stop talking now and let Delanda talk a little bit about what that family center treatment model looks like you know what we kind of do every day and then we'll let our families Hi, everybody. I'm not going to stand, but, and I talk really loud, so everybody <laughs> should be able to hear me. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about family-centered treatment. Like Kathy was saying, we have 10 programs. In 1994, we purchased um, a property in Compton called Key Village. It's an 86-unit apartment complex that has one, two, three, and four bedroom units in the apartment complex. We offer treatment on site with the housing at the treatment program. Um, Twelve of the units have been dedicated to the offices and the treatment services, and the rest of the units are our families that they reside in. And based upon the size of the family determines what size unit they get. We work with the family of reference to the consideration <coughs> of the unit. Um, I think the most unique thing about family-centered treatment um, is that we are able to provide services to the entire family. And it may not be the typical family that we would be accustomed to, it's the family of our client, who the, the client identifies as their family. It could be their mother, it could be their, I mean, it could be their children, it could be their significant other, it could be their brother, whoever their family is, we want to work with the entire family to provide services. We provide services Monday through Friday from 8.30 to 5. All of our clients have to get up and get their children ready for school. They have to cook their own meals. They have to um, clean their own homes. They pay rent at the facility, but they only pay 30% of whatever their income is. And most of our clients are on a fixed income, so that's really not a lot of rent. And if they don't have any income, then they don't pay anything. Um, one of the, the treatment services that we provide are very comprehensive. We work with the entire family. They go to treatment from 8.30 to 5. Um, they do a host of groups from vocational skill groups. A lot of our families did not get an opportunity to finish school, so we offer high school and basic educational classes. We also have computer classes that they attend. We have educational groups. We have parenting. We have relapse prevention. We have grief and loss. We have family counseling. We provide a host of services in order to be able to meet the clients where they are. I think, I, I've been at Shields for about 20 years now. When I first came to Shields, and I was, I was born and I was raised in Compton. So the, the program and the services that we provide are right in the city where I was raised. And I think it was really important to me um, because I could see the impact and the difference that the agency was making in reference to being able to keep families together. I'm also in recovery. I'm celebrating 22 years in May of being clean and sober, and I didn't have the opportunity to have a family-centered treatment model when I actually went through recovery. And so one of the things that's really important for me is that we are able to 
meet our clients where they are, provide them the necessary supports, the advocacy that they need, and anything else that they may need within the community. We work from, you know, identifying the strengths within the family, um, helping the client to identify the strengths within themselves, um, just because they've had some issue or are concerned with substance use and or mental health, um, doesn't mean that they can't recover from that and that they can't go on to live a productive life in, in this uh, society. And so it's just, I don't know, my, my, my whole philosophy and why I think that SHIELDS really works is that because they genuinely care about the community, we genuinely care about the families that we serve. Um, we build relationships with the families that we serve. Um, if all of the clients, they call us um, by our first name, we call them by our first name. Some of them have our phone numbers, um, which can be good and it can be bad sometimes. Um, yeah. Oh, that's a good thing. Um, we really, we really want to see change within the community. And we know with the right type of support and the right type of services that people can change. People can change. People can go on. Like, you would have never thought I was in recovery, right? Mm -hmm. Or nobody else in this room, <laughs> right? So people do change. And people need help, though. And one of the prime things is, is that you have to be able to meet the clients where they are and really be patient, you know, really be empathetic with their situation and show them that you really genuinely care. And once they buy into the fact that you care, then maybe you can also help them to begin to care about making changes in their life. And with that, um, well, I was, was going to say, so, so the, you guys have the articles in your uh, folders, but just to give you kind of an idea um, how this model is effective, across the country, the, the average completion rate in treatment is about 25%, okay? Our completion rates are 80%, okay? And our continued recovery rates are closer to 85 and 90%, which means that which is again one of the reasons why I wanted these particular families to come to show you that it's not about just that moment. <laughs> you know, it, I'm, we're talking about folks in this room who have 15, 20 years of, of sobriety. You know, their children talk a, a little bit about our children's services. We have an on site child development center, which, <laughs> which operates just like, you know, if you were taking, if any of you have children, you're taking them to a child development center. They go all day long, they get <coughs> developmental assessments done, they get an, an individual education plan, they work on their developmental <coughs> activities. You know, the parents work with them so that they understand really about child development. Um, our older kids, like 6 to 18, they go to a program called Heroes and Sheroes which is an intensive like after school program which includes a, a variety of mental health services because I'm not going to sit here and say that the kids aren't affected they are you know and so we have um, just at one program for example at Exodus uh, we have 15 staff that focus solely on our, our youth that are 6 to 18 all of our kids have their own therapist uh, that works with them as well as their, their own case manager you know and they spend a whole lot of time talking about how the impact uh, of their mother's substance abuse on their lives because that's something that has to that they have to talk about many of them have had to uh, I just remember one little girl she, she got to meet we, we've been lucky we've had the drugs are out to meet with us multiple times and so I remember she said to the drugs are she goes you don't understand I have to learn you know it's like a light switch I have to learn how to be a child so I have to turn off my adult light switch so that I can be a child again so, you know, again, that there are many issues that our kids have to work out, but to leave them out of that loop and not have them in treatment means that they would never have the opportunity to address some of those issues. So that's why it's so important for them to be there. We also have a very long-term program. So it takes an average of, you know, 12 to 18 months for our families to complete treatment. But because we have the housing piece built into it, you know, they're able to stay at our housing for another year after they complete treatment so that they can really focus on their educational or career goals. 
you know, and so when they're ready to transition, they usually have between two and a half or three years of sobriety um, as a foundation for them moving on. So, you know, so any, I don't know if you guys want to start to start with what? One other thing. We also offer lifetime aftercare, which is really important to maintaining sobriety, that you have the necessary <coughs> support system in place. And so, and all of these people are alumni, so. <coughs> Yeah. <coughs> I don't want to forget our empowerment model either. <laughs> so all of our programs have client counsel, you know, that they operate on their own. So they, you know, elect their own officers. They run the meetings themselves. They develop all the activities. They take care of, you know, like any of the, you know, Key Village is a large facility, so the grounds have to be maintained. They, they put all of those things into place. Uh, Halloween, Thanksgiving, you know, any, anything that's... Today. Yeah, we had a Valentine's Day dance today. That's all done by our clients without any staff involvement at all. You know, and I think one of the articles that you have in your folders is about catalysts of change, about how we really work to empower our clients to take on those leadership roles so they can begin to practice them while they're in treatment. We do a whole lot of advocacy. Uh, for example, Phyllis is our representative to Sacred Authority, which is a national advocacy group run out of the Rebecca Project in Washington, D.C. So we do a whole lot of letter writing, a whole lot of campaigning. The folks learn that their voices can be heard and that they can make a difference. The officers uh, of those client councils meet with the management of staff, which means me, uh, Charlene, uh, Delanda, they meet with us monthly so that they can directly give us their feedback about how the programs are working, you know, recommendations to, to change things, um, you know, things, because sometimes the staff aren't always honest with us, how's that, <laughs> you know? So we hear directly from the client's voice so that they feel like they have, I mean, it's their program, you know, and so, you know, we want to hear from them so that we make sure that we really are doing everything that we can do, but it also establishes that relationship, because this, to me, a whole part of this is, you know, the relationship as well as the respect. You know, these are the families that are going to, you know, these are the children that are going to go on and they're going to help to run our world, you know, as they grow up. We want to give them everything that we can, give this family everything that we can, that they're able to then move on and do that. And many of them are, which you'll hear from them too. So, um, yeah, we're going to, if you don't have any questions from us, we'll go ahead and let them 